So hi everyone and welcome to our video podcast. This one is going to be about the shark industry, so kind of shark fin and shark meat trade. Um, so I'm Emma. I'm Roby. And yeah, thanks thanks for tuning in to our this latest podcast. Um, so yeah, we thought we'd start with a little bit about um, about sharks and what kind of the industry is so initially when I was we were going to do this topic I was going to talk about kind of the shark fin trade in Asia which gets a lot of press gets a lot of views and that's kind of what you'd think about I think for most people when you think of shark fins you think of shark fin soup in China um and yes that is still kind of the leading the leading demand or that's where the yeah, that's where most of the demand is coming from, is in China mm. and Asia for things like shark fin soup. But I was very surprised to find out how involved the UK is in this. We are. Is this going to really pull on my heartstrings? Because I think it is. Oh. <laughs> I, I was I was shocked um, because I think like a lot of conservation, and I would say I'm not innocent to this. Is kind of you put it as like these conservation topics you think it's so far away you think it's halfway across the Mm. world when actually this is very close to home okay so Um, disclaimer this might make you think twice about ever buying fish and chips again yes (laughs) (laughs) just just a warning in advance um but yeah do you want to maybe say a bit about just about sharks like why why are they important kind of why why we need sure sharks are very important end of (laughs) <laughs> I'm kidding. So <laughs> sharks are members of the the kind of the fish order chondrichthines, um, and that that's really quite an important to understand because that means they've been around since the Ordovician. So this is several hundred million years before the dinosaurs. Sharks have been around for ages. There is a debate that thinks that the ancestral shark you know, common ancestor was one of the first organisms to ever evolve a a jaw from its, interestingly, from its kind of gill slits. They reckon that's how the cells might have developed. Um, But yeah, sharks have been around for a very long time. They weren't always the apex predators of the oceans that we see today, but they've had this incredibly long evolutionary history, far longer than anything almost on land, apart from a couple of insect groups. Um, and yeah, a bit like tigers, a bit like lions, they are apex predators in a lot of marine ecosystems. And this means they're keystone species. They regulate the populations of species down the food chain. They create an ecology of fear to keep animals moving throughout the oceans. And also they're great ocean recyclers as they eat at the surface and then they defecate nutrients from the surface goes down into the depths and then is recycled back up. So sharks really are the linchpins of the marine environment in a way that maybe only the great whales and perhaps plankton are on a similar or or higher level. Sharks are everything to the health of the oceans. Um, A really interesting way that we can see this is in the waters of Mexico in the Pacific coast because there's been such um, decimation of the shark populations. That means that the fish population has exploded, which you would have thought is good but it's the wrong kind of fish because it's the kind of middle predator levels. And because these middle predator fish have exploded in numbers, they've suppressed the populations of much smaller fish, which eat the larval stages of squid and sharks will also eat squid. So now waters off the Pacific coast of Mexico are being overrun with just squid, which eat anything. And so we're the loss of the shark is turning our oceans into an ocean full of squid. So Quick overview. I must have touched a lot of different topics there. Sharks are hella important. We can't afford to lose them. Yeah, no, that that's so, so true. And I think that just goes to show how much they regulate marine ecosystems. And I think there was a, a nice quote from someone saying something along the lines of, we shouldn't be afraid of them. We should be afraid for them. Exactly, because precisely. Because they're, yeah, their numbers are declining. And I think that, that leads in quite nicely to kind of explain well, what is the issue with sharks? Like, why are they threatened? What is happening? Well, there? it's funny you should say that, um, Emma. What is the issue with sharks? Why are they threatened? What is happening there? Over to Emma in the field. Or in the studio. <laughs> Thank you, Roby. <laughs> so, 
I think, I mean, the big problem that you associate with sharks is finning, um, which is when the fins are cut off, so all the fins, so on the upper side and lower side of the body, and sort of the tail ones as well, they'll be cut off out at sea. Um, So then it's as if someone was cutting off all your arms and your legs, and then they chuck the shark back overboard. So it can't swim, it can't do anything, and it basically goes to the bottom and it dies. It's in incredibly inhumane very unethical and this practice is now illegal it doesn't mean it doesn't happen but it's estimated that this practice is killing around 73 million sharks every year and that's thought to be an underestimate because this is kind of what people what's reported or what's seen there's a lot of stuff that goes on illegally wow that's a lot of that's a lot of dead sharks too many dead sharks yeah uh, that that doesn't seem sustainable just... for population recovery. No, no it, it definitely isn't. And I think, so there's now been a transition to, it's a new sort of method of fishing sharks. So this is called the fins naturally attached policy. Right. Um, which means that if you are killing sharks, you need to land the whole shark with the fins attached when it gets to port. So the idea behind that was... If you have lots of sharks taking up space on the boat, um, because before, if you could just cut off the fins, yeah, yeah. you could fill up the boat with fins. So the idea behind that was you the boat fills up more quickly and therefore less sharks will be taken. Right. Okay, that's quite an interesting... It sounds a little bit like a politician's compromise, but uh, it's a start, I guess. I would... Yep, I think politicians compromise sounds good because now what's happened on the backside of that is because you now have more shark meat that's being landed on, coming into port, this is now driving the demand for shark meat because people have realised now that they can make money from the meat instead of just throwing it away. So this has spiked an increase in in shark meat. And of course we didn't see that coming. Of course we weren't that conscientious or foresighted. Of course not. And yeah, it's just, it shows how one problem leads to another. And then also now that you've got the bodies of sharks, this was happening before, but more so now that you've got the bodies of sharks being brought to port is especially um, deep diving sharks. So things like gulpers. Oh yeah, those are weird they ones. Are being, they, they look bizarre. Um, and because yeah, they're all like deep in the ocean. They have really kind of small eyes one of the ones which makes you think god was probably hung over when he was designing that particular fish and he got really embarrassed and then he just decided (laughs) to like hide it in the bottom of the ocean where no one would ever see it (laughs) absolutely um but these deep diving sharks part of their adaptation to kind of deep water lifestyle means they have these really big oily livers Oh, okay that's interesting Um, and so, because I'm trying to think what adaptation that would provide, possibly in terms of just having more fat kind of reserves means that they could and, be deep in the ocean. And buoyancy, I think. So unlike most fish mm. which have, well, unlike most osteichthene bony fish, which have swim bladders, sharks have really big livers instead. So the liver of the great, great white shark is the largest organ in its body. And they use this liver to control wow. buoyancy and depth and also... I think there's a, a homeothermic function as well, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, there's a lot of functions for the shark. And then this kind of links back to a previous podcast we did about beavers, of how something is being exploited that has a function for the animal, but we've turned it into something else. So the oil from the livers, which is called squalene, um, is used in sort of oiling machinery. It's used in skin moisturizers um you name it um we found a use for squalene <laughs> of in, course we did in lots of things yeah so they're now being also sought after for that so that's a little bit of an overview of um so yeah, what's happening so, with sharks so how how guilty are we in the uk is is the question i because I, I i'm not that well versed in shark finning i know a lot about it in south asia because that's where the media likes to point the fingers um is it a case of oh we're pointing fingers elsewhere so we don't we don't see what's happening under our own noses as well are we also involved in this a hundred percent we are and i know really come on and and a lot more than i thought like i said i was kind of we were thinking of targeting this podcast about asia Mm. but 
yeah, I think people need to know how much the UK is involved. Okay, so, tell it to me straight, Doc. Okay, so there was, I think this was an article that came out in 2017, so quite recently, saying that in the space of two years... The UK shipped 50 tons of shark fins to Spain. What? Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> yeah. that's a lot. Uh, why so, Spain? What you've got is you've got Spain is the biggest hub finning hub in the EU. Oh. So you've got this link between the UK, Spain, and then the demand is still coming from China. But the, the thing that shocked me actually, so you've got UK, France, Spain and Portugal um, between, I think it was between 2000 and 2008 so this number might have gone up now um, were responsible for 13.4% of the global shark catches in the world so those countries I just mentioned I'm going to name and shame you all (laughs) even the UK so UK, France, um, Spain and Portugal are listed in the top 25 shark fishing nations in the world. This is, yeah. So it kind of makes you, wow. There's So there's a bit of hypocrisy there when we, you know, point at Japan and Russia and say, stop whaling. But actually, we're finning a load of shark. Oh, so we're not eating the sharks here, are we? We're, we're exporting it. Well... Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay... Yeah, the pro- the plot thickens here with the with the sharks. Ooh, I love a thickened plot. So, um, most of it is being exported because there's money to be made in this massive these massive trade links that are happening across the world. But you, I was surprised to know that shark fins and shark meat is actually being traded quite extensively across the UK. Really, and it is so. This also blew my mind. So, it is currently legal to bring 20 kilos of shark fins as part of your personal allowance if you're travelling into the EU, um, like in your bag. Personal allowance? Personal allowance. You can bring 20 kilos of shark fins. So if you come into the EU with meat or cheese, that will get confiscated and destroyed. If you bring in 20 kilos of shark fins, guess what? That's legal. What the... Flip. (laughs) Oh my god, that's really, really awful. So I think a big issue with this is part of this is the EU. So kind of this is like we've touched on with a few other things. As we leave the EU, this might offer an opportunity for us to change some of these laws. Let's hope. Because what I think what the issue is, is finning is illegal Mm. in the EU and in the UK. So this is the act of cutting off fins, throwing the body of the sharks back into the water. That's illegal. But what's still legal is, so there, there isn't currently a ban on shark fins or the trade of shark meat in the oh, EU. Oh, right. So it's illegal to actually do so, the dirty work, but you can buy and sell them fine. But now that you've got the fins naturally attached policy, mm. it's if it's part of the um, sort of select species of sharks that are allowed, um, the fins and meat from those species of sharks can be legally traded and sold anywhere in the EU. And so I like, imagine... I imagine just thinking of the sharks that we've got in Europe, is is that going to be things like blue sharks, makos, dogfish, that sort of stuff? Yeah, yeah hit the nail on the head with those. Like it's, I think mako and blue shark mm. are the ones that there's, there's no control. There's yeah. no limits on fishing. There's no legislations because apparently they're considered to be doing well enough population wise but i was looking on the iucn and some of them are classed as vulnerable i guess that's uh, so, that's another another example of of what you would call shifting baseline syndrome which was actually coined by by a fisheries scientist to you know explain the fact that every progressive generation thinks that the 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 state of nature that it grew up with is the natural state and so when it gets degraded they say oh yeah we'll go back to that so quite an interesting one is, is mackerel stocks in Cardigan Bay um, are now classed by the EU as within healthy biological limits. And yet over the course of two generations, they have, de- you know, declined in size from three miles long to 300 meters long. And yet because of the way our perception changes with time, we're quite a short, short lived species. We're quite, well, we're quite long lived actually, but our perception is quite short in terms of time and so 
I, I would assume the same thing is happening with these sharks. We, we say, oh yeah, they're sustainable, ignoring the fact that 100 million sharks have been killed in the last 50 years. Yeah, we're, we're completely ignoring that. And also, sort of, as sharks be exploited, kind of with, like you're saying, with the mackerel, it's like their range will change and their distribution within their range You've will change as they're being exploited. Again. So we can't just use these baseline levels from like the 1900s and expect them to stay the same. Um, I think, yeah, that's a big, big issue with all of this. Okay. So what is this I hear about sharks in your fish and chips? <laughs> because this, this is really so... going to, yeah, this is going to be the clincher. I think that, I mean, it caused mass media outrage. Mm. And this was not that long ago. I think this was 2017, 2018, that all the news articles were coming out about fish and chip shops selling endangered species of shark. Because interestingly, there is, I know a fish and chip shop near me where I live, where there is dogfish on the menu, which is a shark species. Yeah. So, I mean, that's... In, in that case, it's unusual that it's actually labelled as what it is, I think. Oh, so another, they're hiding it. Although this is another issue with the EU, EU labelling, it's completely legal mm. for sharks to be labelled under a whole plethora of names, none of which actually include the word shark, and that's fully legal. Isn't that interesting? This, yeah, this, very, this very really convenient. annoys me because, you know, politically, socially, economically, I'm, a, you know, I think the EU is a good thing. But if you look at its environmental policy, it's awful. I mean, shocking, both on land and in the water. I think, yeah, this just raises a lot of issues with EU legislation and, yeah, mm. maybe things that need to be need to be changed. Because, yeah, so with the fish and chip stuff... Um, they can legally so with shark you can legally have it labeled as rock rock salmon rock eel hus and it was even called white fish what in in one yeah. salmon and sharks are not the same thing sharks are chondrichthyes. And sharks and salmon have been distinct for a hundred million years or more they are not the same and rock eel a shark is not an eel and, uh, they don't live on rocks i mean some bottom feeders do i guess but makos don't live on rocks <laughs> So basically, I think even though it's legal, to me, this is very deceptive to the customer. Incredibly. Because if I would see rock, if I saw rock eel in a fish and chip shop, and I maybe thought the eel was something that was more sustainable to eat than some of the fish populations, because in some cases that is the Yeah, case, some eels can be farmed pretty, I, pretty efficiently. Yeah, I would be inclined to maybe order that. And I think a big issue is the people selling it didn't even know what it was. What? So... You'd ask them, what is it? And some of them even claimed for it to be a species of place. They were like, oh, I think it's some type of place. It's not. It's a shark. Oh, my God. Um, and I guess, that, uh, so I yeah. guess is that because the actual fish markets, you know, process it. So the fisherman, you know, the fish shop owner doesn't receive a shark. He receives a cut of meat, which is then labelled, I would assume. I think... In fish and chips, yes, that that was the main issue because they are wanting something that has quite a long shelf life, so yeah. to speak, so that they can keep for a while. They are importing a lot of frozen, sort of frozen fish. And obviously if it's just, well, frozen shark. So if that's cut up and labelled in a deceptive way, then I, I don't blame the people selling it for not necessarily knowing what it was. And, and you know, um, I think... This this really must be challenged, I think, because quite a few times, you know, you, if you go into perhaps um, uh, an, an Asian continental supermarket in the UK where I shop quite a lot, uh, you go to the frozen fish counter and you do see a whole dogfish there. And I've always thought, oh, this isn't OK. We can't have these sharks being being tr tr traded like this. This must be stopped without ever thinking of the complicity of our own fishing industry i always kind of assumed that oh we don't do this this is and it's it's such a current it's such a it's it's such an issue that we always assume that these big harmful ecological practices always happen with other people elsewhere but this this must be highlighted and i think you know this has to change that we are also equally complicit if not more so in terms of our local species uh with the decline in sharks this is awful yeah I, I I mean, I was very shocked and I think that the public needs to know that the UK is not innocent in this in, in any shape or form. Um, 
Because what they did, so it got picked up, this story about the fish and chips got picked up by mass media companies of like, the UK is eating endangered shark, whatever. So that did wake the public Mm. up a little bit. And then you had a really, really awesome study, which was actually done only last year by the University of Exeter. So what they did was they, um, yeah, it was really, I'll send you. Yeah, that'd be be really interesting, actually. I'd love Um, to see that. Yeah. Because what they did was they DNA barcoded, um, I think it was something like three or a hundred plus samples of shark, um, well, alleged like shark Mm. from (laughs) fishmongers. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, rock eels, hus, whatever you want to call it, um, from fishmongers and also from fish and chip shops. Yeah. And it was something like over 80% of these samples were coming from spiny dogfish. So um, just if just for, for you listeners who might not know what a spiny dogfish is, it might not sound like a shark, but it is. It's quite... It's, it's not a, a macro predatory species like a great white or a maker or a blue shark. It's about... Oh, I'm going to try and get on camera. It's about maybe ooh, that long, a meter, maybe a little bit more. And it's a, it's a kind of a bottom dwelling uh, species, bottom to mid level. And it lives in, in the kelp forest. And it's kind of like a mid level predator. It eats like crabs, small fish, lobsters, um, but still very much a shark. Yeah. So, yeah, they are, they are I guess, quite small compared to, to other sharks. Um but what I was surprised to find out was, so in the Northeast Atlantic, they are considered critically endangered. That's us, isn't it? We're Northeast Atlantic. That is us. I was, I was just doing it in my head and I was like, hang on. Yeah, no, that is us. <laughs> That's our corner of the Atlantic. Yeah, so it was a bit of a sort of a controversy about where these sharks were actually coming from because technically it's illegal because of this classification for them to be caught in UK waters and landed um sort of where their distribution is critically endangered but because it's frozen they think that they were being um sort of imported from places like canada or oh, um, cunning. sort of that that area of north america Clever. where it where the numbers were slightly higher but i think it's still let's see if i can find this so yeah it's still a globally threatened mm. species and this is what the the majority of what was in fish and chips um yeah so very powerful study i think yeah. to kind of um prove this and scientifically show that use dna barcoding yeah. to show yes this bit of this fish that you just ordered in your fish and chip shop is from this globally threatened species of spiny dog and it's interesting that sharks always get the short end of the stick in this one because if it's a globally threatened species the leopard is a globally threatened species and i would imagine there'd be a lot of an outcry if we started eating leopard and dolphins which look quite similar to sharks and are also apex predators i think you know, if it wasn't for Jaws and the fact that there have been one or two, okay, not one or two, but the, the fact that there are occasionally fatal shark attacks, if they didn't, if this didn't happen, we would think they're the most beautiful creature in the seas. Yeah. And I think it's, it's a case of sharks being misunderstood. I think very true what you said about things like in the rainforest or leopards or things like that. It's almost, it's more accessible to people. Mm. They could actually go and they could see one. Whereas... I think for a lot of people, unless you dive or you're into marine biology, it, it feels very mm. distant. Like the deep sea, yeah. like I don't know half the stuff that lives there, but I, I still think anyone does. I find it <laughs> epic. And it, um, but I think it's that detachment that stops people yeah. caring. And also it's it's a kind of, it's unfortunate that all of these myriad other sharks like hammerheads and makos and blue sharks, which are Paul Beagle's dogfish, which pose no harm to anyone, are, you know, getting the short end of the stick possibly as a result of our interaction with just three species the great white the bull shark and the tiger shark um which also shouldn't be hunted or killed at all they kill far less people every year than dogs do but it's interesting that you know we demonize just three members of a massive evolutionarily distinct and diverse and ancient order and suddenly the whole the whole gang gets gets you know persecuted mercilessly yeah, it is. It is merciless persecution. That's kind of the only way that I would describe it. And I was just curious. I did a quick Google um, to see how easy it was to still get what this supposed shark. And so I typed in rock salmon for sale UK. Mm. And immediately I got um, 
loads of websites where it was for sale. You can buy buy blue shark steaks oh, for about three three pounds and fifteen. Three pounds and fifteen p. You can get like four blue shark steaks um, for that price. Oh my god! And I was like, "How? This is so easy." I just I googled it from my laptop yeah. at home, and yeah. I mean, shall, but, um, shall we end on a little, perhaps a little positive of what you, if you're listening and you feel concerned about this, can do? If you do go into a fish and chip shop and you see something like rock hus or rock eel or some of these other ones, uh, what, what are the other things they're called? Smooth hound, rock salmon, taupe. Taupe yeah. is actually the name of, a, of, a, of at least five shark species. So if you do see something like this, please do think twice about ordering it because you don't want to con- help contribute financially or otherwise to this, this, this really devastating industry, which is having a massive impact on our oceans. Yeah, no, I think that's very true. It's, it's really good, I think, for consumers to be aware, to question things. And then I think just in terms of broader solutions that we maybe need to address is we are leaving the EU, whether we agree with that or not. And this is a chance maybe to really push for legislation about greater transparency of what's happening with the shark fin and shark meat industry. Um, This is a moment. We need to seize it. Yeah. Yeah, we do. And there are a really good um, organisation that's working with this is called Fin Fighters. And they, their goal is to make the UK shark fin free by 2023. So check them out. They're doing some really good work. There's campaigns and stuff. And that is a so. good that is a good goal. And that is a good cause to support. So let's end this one here. We hope you found it not too depressing, but also informative. And we hope you feel a bit more aware about some of the issues that are affecting um, Britain and its involvement in, in, in the degradation of the seas. Yeah, no, absolutely. So thanks everyone for listening. You can check out more updates on um, Grizzly's YouTube channel and Biome by Grizzly on Instagram. And if you want to check us out, we are Emma Hodson Wildlife and Roby Watkinson Wildlife. So yeah, we'll see you next (laughs) time. See you next time. Bye.